never in history have the people that have been banning books and forcing book burning and causing the censorship, they've never been on the right side of history, ever. March Madness and save 20% off on all Nutricon online orders. And you can use the code Jester Radio and save 15% off on all Cream Supreme orders. What's happening, guys? John and Jack, the J and Jesse. <coughs> yes. What's up? That's very cute, eh? Yes. Oh. Serendipitous. <laughs> yes. Good to be back. Bro. Yeah. Jack, last time you were here, I think we've swapped roles. Last time you were here, you were skinny. And I was, I wouldn't say big like you are now, but I was maybe more anabolic at the time. No, I think I think the last time I came here, I just managed. You just started. Started again, yeah. Managed to sort my life out. And how is the gains? What, what was your weight like? Well, let's say at your, the beginning, the infancy of your return. Um, I think I was bulk. I was quite like, <clears throat> I was quite puffy when I actually last saw you. I must have been just over 100. I'm trying to lean down a little bit. Um, Jono's mom prefers the guys a little bit leaner, a little bit more nimble. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's nice. <laughs> what do you have to say about that? I don't have a comment for that. Is one. that why you lean as well? Yes. <laughs> I was going to make dieting. mommy proud. <laughs> yes. <laughs> started dieting a week ago. I already lost like 37 kilos. Well, you're going to burn calories with a watch face that big. I know. It's fair enough. <laughs> so weight, weight's on your wrist. Yes. And I tore a lat yesterday. So it's a bit difficult. Really? Mm. Grade one subscap tear. Doing what? Pull-ups. Awkward when you weigh 15 kilos, but you know. Wow. Injuries get the best of us. We're starting off like that. Yes, cool, yes man. We are. It's going to be a long hour for you. <laughs> so, Jono was on recently. Jack's got some tattoos. New update. Yeah, proper. It's just uh, really jumping uh, balls deep into the midlife crisis. It, um, I think in, in Benoni that means um, I live around the corner. Uh, Jesse, maybe you can help edify me. What does the word agape mean? Okay, it's enough. I'm not sure. I would say wide, open. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be awkward if you got the word agape underneath your left peck, for example. Jono, thoughts? Well, you your, show left, your left, I wouldn't say peck because then that implies muscle. Yes. So maybe left Breast under issue. his yeah. heart. <laughs> and under, under, under his left gynecomastia. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys you have... Show, wow. You want to show the camera your mad tat there? You can, bro. I'm all right, bro. Okay. No, I'm good, thanks. But you guys have come a lot closer now after Jono was... Hit his midlife, quarter life crisis, yes. whatever it was, and moved back to Joburg. So you guys have got a lot closer, and Jack, especially you, your hands in Jono's food. Yes, Phys- yeah. physically closer. Yes, yeah. It's yeah. the small things on a daily basis that obviously allow us to sort of cultivate that uh, massive productivity in the numbers that you see we generate as trainers. So we'll drive those mad cars and things like that. It's just it's the small things. Yeah, it's fingering the, each other's food. It's the cream of punches. Hey. <laughs> The eight o'clock in the morning, whole day ruined immediately. But John, no, the most of the time I just see you sleeping in your car. That does happen a lot, I'll be honest. Well, look, in fairness, I get asked often why is John always sleeping? I mean, the man's in at like five and he leaves at like eight, nine every night. So, I mean, he gets a cancellation, he tries to capitalize. That's why he's always sleeping. Of course, I'll capitalize by punching him in the head. Yeah. Yeah. It helps the sleeping patterns a lot when you just fall asleep and then you feel a big chubby fist in your forehead. <laughs> it resets the circadian rhythms. Yes, it helps. It's important. Yeah. Get back into that REM cycle. Yes, 100%. <laughs> so are you coming back on stage? What's this plan now? No, Jesse, um, I'm riddled with injuries and things like that. Um, not just, I mean, it just th- that affect me from an asymmetrical uh, sort of uh, balance and proportion perspective. So in terms of standing on stage, highly unlikely. But yeah, just going through the motions, managing my injuries, prepping as if I would you know, want to get on stage, I might do some shoots, some video content, obviously for my page and my social media handles and things like that. But um, no, definitely no immediate plans to get on stage. Uh, Sibs is traveling to Brazil to compete. John, I can hear you breathing, bro. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Although I like it, the audience may not. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, Sibs is competing at the Arnold Classic in Brazil um, at the end of April. So I'm going with him. Nice. And I thought I might as well, I can't have him looking... You know, completely uh, godlike, and uh, you know he can't be the only one waking up yeah. in Brazil every morning covered in bitches. So, okay. I thought I'd follow suit. Well, at least now you can get your uh, good night or good day's sleep yes. and finish your meals. A little bit of peace and quiet, clean meals. I'm looking forward to no it. head punches. When do you leave? <laughs> On twenty, I think it's the twenty first of April. Oh, thank God. Yeah. So his journey now and his improvements that he's been made, I've been watching, and he's looking lethal. Yeah, it's been two years since he's on stage, maybe a little bit longer. So uh, we've taken some time off uh, and Sibs has adopted 
um, you know, really good sort of mentality to his off-season. He sort of, he, he applies the same level of discipline and fastidiousness uh, to his off-season as most people would apply to their prep, you know. So in terms of his, his meal timing, his consistency, his training, he's really, he's really thrown everything in the kitchen sink at this prep and it's reflecting in his physique. Um, yeah, and with a massive emphasis on recovery. So, you know, getting his meals in, sleeping, uh, hot and cold therapy, colon cleanses, uh, routinely giving, you know, blood to reduce his hemotocrit, his blood pressure, um, IV drips with certain, you know, mineral and, and vitamin cocktails that are put together for him. And uh, the results sort of speak for themselves. So, uh, yeah, we, we're not going there for a pap smear or a, or a haircut or a handshake. We're going there to show the world what and who Cebu is. And hopefully we can secure an Olympia qualifier We've not uh, rack up some points because we've got another couple international shows planned for the rest of the year. And our goal is to get Cebu on the Olympia stage at the end of the year. Yeah. So is that the journey now he does this show and then he'll, if he does well or when he does well, be able to go to a qualifier and then if he does well at the qualifier, make it to Olympia? Or? I'm not entirely sure. I think if he wins the show, it's an automatic O qualifier. Okay. Um, if he gets sort of top three or top five, he'll earn points. And I'm not entirely sure how many points. But we're also looking at a couple other shows which we already dog-eared um, for the rest of the year. Um, but yeah, you know, Sibu's goal is not just to get to the Olympia. Sibu wants to sort of follow in the footsteps of Ronnie and he wants to secure eight or more Sandals. And in order to do that, I mean, we all know that longevity is quite a questionable thing in bodybuilding. He needs to start getting on the O stage and brushing shoulders with the best of the best and um, yeah, making a name for himself. We also, as you know, as his coach, we need to see him up there shoulder to shoulder with the best so we can get a very good um, indication of where he's lacking, where he needs to work on. He needs to start becoming more and more front of mind for those international judges. And you'll see that becomes more apparent when they start calling him by name and not by number. All of those sort of things are very important. I don't know how closely you speak of longevity, <laughs> how closely you guys follow Callum Von Moga. Mm. Have you, I don't know if you've seen, and I hope you have, or have some insight into it, his whole derailing now. He was... I was, a, I was a big fan, uh, particularly when his first YouTube video came out, Mad Desire, and sort of put him on the map. And then I heard him open the hole in his face in Pumping Iron One, and I had to unfollow him immediately and i haven't followed him since so maybe you can yeah there's a lot more drama so he was in australia and he got out of his car he has some altercation in a car park he got out of his car chased a guy with a machete and then he went to jail i don't know how long it was he got out in bail and they found i think it was heroin and cocaine and steroids in his car steroids? The, the steroids yeah, can be understandable <laughs> And Beautiful. I mean, it's just, so and it's, I, I don't know, Jono, do you follow him? Yes. I don't know if you've seen how his social media has changed quite a bit and you can definitely see something's out of whack. I think he went from very like, what, would, what, what I enjoyed about him was very professional um, and he relied heavily on his physique as to who he was. Um, very transparent and very open as to, you know, his personality. His YouTube was very, you know, what you see is what you get. Which his I dog, his parrot. 100%. His, yeah. Like his whole life was sort of intertwined. Like you saw his personal life, his, which I enjoyed. You can get to know him pretty well as a person. But I feel his Instagram, I actually unfollowed him recently just because he, he wasn't really adding the value that I feel. Because on my Instagram, I'm very aware of who I follow and the value they add. And I just feel it wasn't really something that I wanted to see on a daily basis. So, yeah, I think he's also lost the plot a bit um i think he's with, with his knee injury with his shoulder with his bicep whatever else i think he's realizing that bodybuilding's slipping away slowly um so he's obviously putting that emotion to other outlets which probably isn't the healthiest either jack in your professional opinion do you think <clears throat> he obviously he does have a great body but do you think he has an arnold equivalent body relatively so or was it just because he you know his likeness in his face was kind of like arnold yeah, I think in his original YouTube video, that Mad Desire one that I mentioned uh, earlier, um, yeah, he had the sort of the structure, the height, similarities and facial features. Um, yeah, the, uh, I don't, I think Arnold is so unique that it's difficult, but I, in terms of, of, you know, guys in the sort of fitness sphere and the social media spaces, influences, he's probably the most uh, um akin to Arnold from a from a physic, physical perspective. But yeah, like I said, Arnold's, you know, Arnold was Arnold for a reason, so yeah. And then you went vegan. Yeah, now, oh, he's, so become, he said. now he's become a left-wing Democrat fanny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How were those robots on the way uh, out? Yeah, they were out. It was, uh, 
you know, I got my blood pressure up quite a bit. But, Jack, you can't expect much. Well, you you should have learned by now in this country. Well, you know, I would have thought that now the DA are running Johannesburg that they'd do a spectacular job, but I'm, you know, I'm the first one to put my hand up and resign myself to the fact that this is probably the worst Johannesburg has ever been run. So, DA, congratulations. Thank you very much. You, you most definitely won't be securing my vote yes. ever as soon as possible. <laughs> That's funny. Jono, you and voting, bro. Mm. You're not as political as Jack. Or at least not. not as vo- vocal. Um, I don't think anybody is as vocal as Jack in his defense. Um, yeah, bro, I'm very like, not that I, I don't research it and, you know, go into as much depth as Jack does. Obviously, I think it's more of a passion for Jack as well. Um, for myself, like, my family talks about it quite a lot and obviously my dad's a pilot, so he's obviously tra- quite widely traveled. So we end up talking about a lot of different topics and I think I learn through my parents a lot and through my brother and um, so I sort of build my own opinion. Um, but again, like, not always something that directly impacts me or that I think about as much on a day-to-day basis as I do other aspects of my life, I yeah. think. So definitely something that you should be aware of. Like if someone says who's the president, you know, what's going on in the country, you should definitely know these things. But in terms of the depth that I go into, probably not, yeah, not as much. That's deep. So you know who the president is. <laughs> yes. That's spectacular. I mean, Jack, I was know. actually speaking to someone today and they were like, Jack's hectic on Instagram. I'm like, yo, but that's Jack. Like that's his brand. I think a lot of your success also attributes that. The fact that you are transparent and you're vocal. You know, some people, and that that's, I mean, if you... People know where you stand. Yeah, I mean, my entire social, well, my entire fitness career, everyone was saying to me, <clears throat> you can't do this, you can't say that, you'll never procure a sponsor, don't do this. And I just thought it was just poppycock. You know, I obviously see people uh, sort of louding this facade of who they wanted people to think they were on social media, but in person they were completely antithetical to this, um, this person they'd propped up on a pedestal on social media. So, yeah, I just try to be as transparent as I possibly can. Um, you know, I use social media, Instagram, as a sort of canvas for what's going on in my head. Uh, you know, I don't just talk about fitness. I obviously often post videos of me finger blasting Jono's food and punching him in the head. But, yeah, talking about politics and, um, yeah, you know, uh, most recently a lot of this, this uh, biological men competing in women's sports, which is driving me up the wall, which we'll get, on, we'll get to. Yeah. It's a whole other kettle of fish but yeah you know a lot of people ask me for advice and um you know how how to sort of cultivate a fitness career and i just say the same thing be yourself be unapologetically yourself be authentic because you'd rather people gravitate towards you as a result of who you are than who you pretend to be you know i've never had a problem procuring sponsors i've had multiple top level sponsors in the industry very lucrative endorsements very good relationships with the top tier supplement companies and um, yeah, my business and my brand has grown um, to where it is today, you know, with a, with a full trainer stable and quite a large extensive client base directly and inadvertently through the affiliate trainers that we have, purely as a result of the fact that I stuck by my guns. I told everyone who told me I shouldn't do this and shouldn't say that to go and fuck themselves. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm never going to change in that department. Yeah. Well, John, you pulled this, are you going to say something? Mm-mm. Go okay. for it. So you put this podcast together essentially. It was... Yeah. Your brainchild. So you mm. want to discuss some topics. Well, what, I think what it, was, were those? it was more Jack as well. Um, what are we discussing? Yeah, we're discussing um, talking about um, self-accountability, introspection, and obviously responsibility. I mean... Oh, there were some big words. Yeah. No wonder it was from you. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, we were talking about obviously our clients yes. as trainers that are you know consistently... You see it on social media, not our direct clients, but sometimes clients of other coaches you know, blaming their coaches for the results they didn't acquire with the work they weren't prepared to do. And me personally, obviously, having trainers come on board, uh, you know, sign agreements and leave very acrimoniously, um, often absconding from the contractual contractual arrangements and agreements that they signed. I hate that when trainers try to leave. We'll get on on to that (laughs) subject. Um, Yeah, because, uh, you know, it it really annoys me. People look at Sibs, for example, yes, you know, the work that you've done with Jono and with Sibu is incredible, you know, Sibu's so amazing as an athlete, John is doing so well, it's got nothing to do with me. It really doesn't. You know, I gave John and Cebu exactly the same opportunities, coaching, mentorship, infrastructure, and facilities that every trainer that's ever joined 
sheriff training systems have had. The difference is that they've used their own volition to leverage off of them and, and excel and to become, you know, captains in their respective fields. John is a trainer and Cebu is a trainer and now is a bodybuilder. And um, yeah, it just, it just really fucking irritates me when we get these fucking losers that join us as clients and join us as trainers that just, you Jack didn't give me the time and attention that I wanted and that's why I never succeeded. It's, it's bullshit. You know, people need to ask themselves the hard questions. You know, first of all, did I want it nearly as badly as I communicated to my coach that I did? You know, that's the difficult question. Um, did I really vest what I said I was going to vest? Was I prepared to get out of my comfort zone? And most importantly, am I fucking coachable? And I think <clears throat> what goes hand in hand with that is also like last year in, what, November, Dev's show? Yeah. So I was living in Durban, happily sipping margarita on the beach, earning seven rand fifty, and Jack and Sibs flew down for Devlin's show. Anyway, I saw Jack there and we chatted and I hadn't spoken to Jack for a while before that. And he was saying to me, Brew, like, what are you doing here? Why are you in Durban? I said, no, you know, I'm going through a bit, like I've come to find myself and, you know, the proper quarter life crisis. And he was just not very impressed. So I said, Brew, you, you're worth a lot more than this. Like, I really think you should come back to Joburg and make something of yourself. So I was like, yeah, bro, I've just moved here. Let me just find my bearings. I'll think about it. And eventually I was waking up day after day doing the same shit every day. And I thought, actually looked in the mirror, I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Like you're 24, 25. Like I really expected more from myself. So I phoned Jack. I'm like, bro, I'm on my way. So I moved into a place. Hadn't even seen the place. Moved here, signed contracts, moved into the gym with zero client base one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I had a, a handful of clients in Joburg, but my entire client base is overseas, Cape Town, Durban. I have no one in Joburg, well, not many in Joburg. And going back to that sort of the premise that everyone gets the same opportunities, for myself when I went back to the gym, I immediately got 500 business cards printed and I walked around Santon City, I walked around Bryanston Mall and I went person to person to person handing out business cards. How's it, this is what I do, come for a free session, come for a free session, Brew person after person, day after day. The first like two months I worked at STS or six weeks for Mahala, five in the morning to eight at night, back to back for no pay. Like it was all complimentary sessions. And from there, I built up a client base within a month. Like I was fully booked and now like I don't have space. So the same thing, like when new affiliates want to join underneath me and we've had a few interviews and I just look at these guys and I just say, well, are you prepared to do this? They're like, no, no, no. But what about the leads Jack gives you? I'm like, but those are bonuses. If Jack gives me a lead, sweet. Jack's given me some, some fantastic leads and they become very good clients. Misha was a lead, fantastic client, one of my best friends. That, but I, I don't depend my success through Jack and his leads. I've got the infrastructure, the same as any trainer would have when they come on board. And it's up to you. Are you going to be a victim and complain about what you don't have and why Sibu is successful, why am I successful, why is Carl successful, why is Jack successful, and whine about... At the end of the day, no one cares. If you, like I said in the last podcast, if you're not making money, if you're not happy, if you're not confident in yourself and what you bring to the table... That's on you. Like there's, there is no one that's going to hand that to you. So, yeah, I don't like that victim mentality at all. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's this, we're in the society of, um, well, in the current da da daily society of sort of condoning mediocrity and participation trophies and you can be anything you want and it's all right to be mediocre because not everyone wants to reach. And that's fine, you know, but you do you. If you want to join Sheriff Training Systems either as a client of mine or as an affiliate trainer, We've got, you know, I've got one fucking motto and that's FIFO. You fit in or you fuck off. No one puts a gun to your head and says you have to join and you have to sign on the dotted line. But if you do sign on the dotted line, it's a contractually binding contract. And I'm going to ensure that you follow that through because I've got people like Jono that came here with literally the clothes on their back and worked, you know, hand to mouth, uh, clawed with their fingernails to build a client base. Jono went from invoicing sort of 30,000 Rand in November to upwards of 130, 140,000 rand this month, if I'm not mistaken. A bit more, but yeah. Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> Old big yeah. dick over here. <laughs> and then you've got he guys asked. like Sibu, who, you know, a lot of, not a lot of people know, but when he came through for the first six, seven months of his affiliation, he was living in his car, and he honored his agreements. He honored his obligations. He didn't make excuses. He was first in and last out, and don't think it's been all sunshine and rainbows. He's also had ebbs and troughs, and, you know, dealing with um, depression and anxiety, crippling depression at times. And he's gained sponsors and lost sponsors, but he's in a position today where he's one of the top earning trainers. He earns seven figures. I don't know many personal trainers in South Africa that earn seven figures. And, um, but more importantly, 
It's not just about money. Yes, money can obviously provide a better way of life, but it's the fact that he can put his head on his pillow every night and Jono can put his head on his pillow every night with a sense of pride at which they've managed to cultivate. They've built a career. They haven't just built a business that feeds them from hand to mouth. And over and above that, they've established incredible relationships, not unlike the relationship Jono just mentioned with Misha. You know, lifelong relationships with anchor clients that see you three, four, five times a week, a lot more than some of us see our own friends and family. And these clients, you know, you see five, 10, 15 year, build five, 10, 15 year relationships with. And some of these people you help through enormous adversity from getting divorced to losing their jobs to losing children. And you help these people sort of mitigate um, a lot of the adversity that life throws at them and help them navigate through these sort of really dark, murky waters that life throws at us. And um, there's no greater feeling. And then you get these fucking morons that come on board and, you know, and then I get it after the first month when someone signed a 12-month contract, they're like, hi, Jack. And I get an email. Hi, Jack. I regret to inform you that I can no longer continue because I just can't cope with the stress. It's very difficult waking up at five in the morning and having to drive 25 minutes. To I just read this stuff and I'm just like, it takes every cell in my body not to pick up the phone and just say, you're a fucking loser. Like, I didn't ask you to join the affiliation. You asked me, you applied, you wrote a motivation letter. And you inspired me to afford you this opportunity. And we're not five minutes in. And you fucking bailing because you have to wake up early. Like, you just, you, you're so shit. You're so pathetic. And it, you know, I, I say that unapologetically because I'm so fiercely defensive over the affiliates that have gone through some of the adversity that they have. Like, Jono has suffered with crippling, crippling depression. But he managed to pull himself up by the proverbial bootstraps and get himself into a position where he's got an incredible client base and he's, some, he's built something that he's really proud of over and above the financial annuity of what that means. And it's the same with clients. You know, clients come on board and, you know, I, I, again, I'm, I'm very unapologetic about the fact that A, I charge like a wounded buffalo and B, I choose my client lists. Clients inquire and I get Kyle, who's my deputy sheriff and my assistants to reach out. And he sort of ascertains, first of all, whether I have availability. And secondly, if these people have the ethos and the mental tenacity to be coached by me, because it's not easy. I'm not going to tell people what they want to hear. I'm not a fucking hype man. It's not my job to babysit you and mollycoddle you and tell you everything's going to be all right. I'm not interested in that because I'm vesting my time and energy with the people who are front of mind that have just lost kids and are still making it to their training sessions. And I've got certain clients that have terminal illnesses that are making their training sessions and showing up and so grateful to be there and work and bleed out of their fucking eyes to achieve their goals. So I do get incensed when I, you know, detect this, this loser mentality around me because it's just, it's so, like I said, antithetical to the ethos that we're trying to cultivate amongst us as trainers and amongst our client base. We don't want that there. And again, and a lot of the other reason is, I've spoken about this before, Jesse, um, you know, when we look introspectively, we all have those voices. This is so hard, this is so difficult, don't do this, stop, quit, you know, I can't do this. And we have to fight those own sounds and voices and, and sort of negative aspects in our daily life and then to hear someone else perpetuating it and they're not making any tangible effort to try and, um, you know, mitigate that on their behalf. It's just, it's too much. And I think a, a big factor is also, like I think for yourself, I'm also fortunate enough that I can get to a point where I'm quite particular with who I take on as clients. Because you must remember, like Jack mentioned, if you're going to be coaching someone, you know, I go, say I work five first sessions at five, last sessions at eight, say working 13, 14 hour days, you're spending at least nine or 10 hours with other human beings. So if these aren't people that are adding to your life and adding something to your life, it's going to really drag you down on multiple aspects, whether it's emotionally, energy wise, like Amisha's one of my first clients every morning. When I start the day, I know it's good, I'm going to leave that session more positive for the rest of my day. And I want to have every single session thereafter with people that inspire me or that I can inspire them and they feed off that energy. So like I'm very, I, I try and of late remain very exclusive in terms of who I deal with. Um, I think your energy is very, like energy is very trans transmissible. 
Yeah, yeah. So, it's, it's, and it's not arrogance at all. Mm. It's confidence in our ability. And also you're doing your other clients during the course of the day who you have a great relationship with a massive disservice. If you've sat there and you've just poured negative, you poured more and more energy into someone that is just a taker and just saps it from you. And then you don't have enough of that to give to those people that may really need it. Those clients that are going through adversity and terminal illnesses and, you know, lost their jobs and really want to come in there and work and make something of themselves. And I'm huge on that, that reciprocation of energy. Like, like you mentioned in terms of um, who trainers are, like people invest in people. There's a million personal trainers. Every second person's an online trainer. Every second person's a trainer. But there's trainers that earn five grand a month and trainers that earn 175 grand a month. What differentiates them is firstly, I think, what value you add as a trainer. Are you just going, cool, five sets of 12 bicep curls, cool, eat your chicken and broccoli, sweet, see you tomorrow. Are you that kind of trainer? There's so much more to it. It's not just personal training. Because you spend so much time with them, you have to be able to add a huge amount of more value to that person's life, which is why I'm, I remain very, I invest in people that invest in me. If I feel a lack of investment from one side, whether it's a client, a relationship, a friend, a family member, a cannot a parent, it's a little bit difficult, but anything like that, I'm very big on like just slowly distancing myself or removing myself. So I've, you know, of late I've had a lot of clients that just say, you know what, I, you, you're a fantastic client, but I don't think this is the right relationship for me. So, and that's fine. Everyone has the um, right to choose who they want to interact with. So I think being able to, you know, cultivate a client base that also adds value to your life, wildly important. So you now working those, those they on your feet, you know, with mm. people. And obviously it's draining because, you know, you might get someone that is, you know, amazing personality on a Monday. Tuesday they come in, they're a terrible, they're, I don't know, a business partner, tell them something bad. They're in, now they're in the session, they're negative. You know, how is it, you know, trying to motivate them back because you know they're a positive person, you know. That's that's not a problem, Jesse. People have ebbs and troughs in their, in their energy levels. But when you have a click with someone, you actually find that you yourself feel quite inflated after you've helped one of these clients that is on a low. You don't feel like that's detracted from your session. You actually feel like, again, you've cultivated a sense of pride that you've managed to change or turn that person's day around. You know, so, th th you know, that's why you need to be specific when you sort of uh, get into, you know, the, the semantics of energy transference and so on and so, so forth. It's like, if you click with a client, I, I have clients that come in and they have off days. That's not a problem at all. But when they leave, I don't feel any less as a result of the fact that I had to motivate them. So that's my job, you know, to help motivate and push those people who are deserving and who are showing up. Um, but it's not, it's not, you know, if it's a, if it's a, it's a, you know, it, you can have a draining client that can come in and be having a good day and they still drain and detract from you just as a result of the fact that there's not a sinking of energy. But um, yeah, as a whole, Jono's client base, or who Jono, Jono is very similar to me in terms of he's very A-type. I also attract very sort of A-type personalities. And yes, there are times we will need to motivate clients, but a good analogy that I use is if I was a Sherpa on Mount Everest, you know, I'm, I'll help you summit Everest. I'll, I'll carry you if I need to on the last 15 feet of the, on the peak without oxygen. But I'm not going to come to you at base camp, open up your... Your, uh, your little tent and make you a cup of, cup of coffee and tickle your hair and say, do you want to wake up and do you want to try and, do you want to try and climb Everest today? That's not my job. I'm not interested in doing that. So you start off sort of cultivating the correct tools which we spoke about is accountability, introspection, looking in within for your answers. Um, not to say bad things don't happen to people. Of course that does, but how we choose to react to that can make a massive difference to the outcome thereof. And instilling, uh, you know, the, uh, the the foundations of discipline, consistency, compliance, dedication, all of those things. Because as we all know, motivation is completely overrated and it ebbs and troughs. You know, it comes, it spikes and it dips and it's it's largely irrelevant. Motivation so we, gets it, you started, <coughs> discipline keeps you going. 100%. And That's if it. like I have a lot of clients that say, John, how do you stay motivated? I don't, like, it's, often I don't want to train. Very, very frequently lately I don't want to train. But at the same time, like, you don't always want to wake up for work. You don't always want to flip and go to the bathroom, but you have to. Like, the same way that I think 
Oh, also on a change of topic, also, you know, going back to uh, self-accountability on failures. Like, I think you're also accountable to yourself. If you're not eating right, if you're not training, if you, you know, missing sessions, whatever the case may be, that also falls back on your shoulders. Like, there's no one else. You can make all the excuses you want. That's cool. It'll help but justify it and reason it to yourself. But at the end of the day, you still haven't made progress. Whether it's in work, aside from finances, whether it's in work, your physique, your friendship base, your circle, whatever it is, you owe it to yourself to also be consistent and disciplined in that aspect. Yeah, I think I th what I like to say often is that inspiration is far more, more powerful than motivation. Inspiration is forever. You know, like for example, you can in I'm, I'm inspired to be a better father for my son. You know, and whatever that means in whatever facet or area that I'm trying to develop within myself, that is far more important. Sometimes I might not be motivated, but then I go back to my inspiration. I'm like, this is important. I need to make it happen. And I'll do that and I'll do it well in the absence of motivation. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. Going over to your son now, and it's a lot of, you know, people like, let's say, look at someone that a parent that is banting. How do they approach their kids' diet? You know, obviously, you've got a great knowledge of nutrition. How are you going to, you know, advocate certain foods, try and, you know, stay away from copious amounts of sugar growing up? Like, how's that balance? Because when we all grew up, you know, nutrition wasn't as at the forefront of our parents' minds, but now being a father, you know, nutrition and health, it's a very I think you know, there's a very thing. easy way to sort of uh, approach this, Jesse, and uh, I'll pretty much do whatever Finley's mother tells me to do. Okay, that's yeah. true. Sarah really knows what she's doing from a nutritional standpoint, and she really is an absolutely incredible mother, and I can't fault her at all. So she's kind of uh, leading in this aspect, and I'm sort of following suit. For the first three months of... I think it's the maternal instincts as well. They're kind of just is. always there. Yeah. Um, in the first three months as a dad, you kind of feel like a little bit like a useful idiot. Yeah, um, imagine. From three months onward, uh, Finn, Finley's kind of become really sort of self-aware and starts tracking you with his eyes and engaging and smiling. How does that change as, a, you know, as the kid's father? It's like a light switch. It's incredible. Now all of a sudden you're not so much of a useful, useless idiot, you know? You're useful idiot. idiot. Yeah. No, you're just an idiot. Yes. Yeah, because you're sitting there and now he thinks you're funny and you're making noises and you can engage. And um, obviously I try to do my very, very best, but you, you can't sort of downplay the maternal role that has been. When of he's course. screaming off his tits, I go back to sort of useful idiot mode. I don't know what I'm doing. And it's like Sarah, take him. Mm. And then like four or five seconds, he's chilled and he's calmed down. Um, so yeah. Um, I'm just letting Sarah guide in this aspect and it's quite um, quite refreshing just to have someone else tell me what to do for a change. Yeah. Yeah. And you, bro, what's your life, you know, in terms of – because obviously, you know, times are changing a lot more, especially with females where, you know, now 31% of females over the age of 31 – or sorry, 51% of the – 51% of females over the age of 31 don't have kids. Mm. And it's never been that high. <clears throat> You know, women now are, have the ability to focus on career more than what they used to be able to. It's not just, you know, you're 21, you better get married and have a kid. What's your goal in terms of family? Like, are you a family man? What are you, Jono? Do you see yourself being a stay-at-home mom? Um, ignoring that. <laughs> yes, um, not the stay-at-home mom version. But, um, yeah, for me, I'm very... Um, I'm at a point where I don't need someone in my life, but I want someone in my life. And I know what I add, the value I add to a person's life, and I'm completely like confident in that. I back myself. Lying sack of shit. Jono desperately needs someone in his life more than he knows. Needs so needs more than needs. once. Needs desperately Fully needs. Disagree. He needs to calm. He needs to cool it. Okay. Our main boy over there needs to calm the fuck down. Okay. He desperately <laughs> needs someone. Is it, is it all the money he's got now? He's, know, he's enjoying listen, the spoils of war. Listen, I take my hat off to him. I mean, I'm living vicariously through the man, but he's living his best life. But he definitely needs someone there just to anchor him and sort of provide, you know, the proverbial rudder to his ship. Look, I think anyone that gets a solid relationship, it definitely adds, you know, it's undoubtable the amount of value that adds to your life. So, yeah, 100%, I'm all for it. And I think going back to what you mentioned now about, you know, women being what do you say, 51% over the age of 31 without kids. Yeah. I think it's actually fantastic. Like I think a lot of people get pressured into either getting married too young, getting babies too young. And I think it also, when you see, like I don't know about you, but my Instagram blows up with engagements, um, marriages, pregnancies, um, you know, whatever, at very young ages. Like I've got friends that are 21, 22 having kids. Like, you know, it's, 
it's hard for me to say because I don't have a leg to stand on in terms of I don't have kids. And I think if I had my own kid, I would feel very different. But for myself, unless you're at the point in life where you, like I feel that I could provide a kid with the life it deserves, I think that's also an important point to get to. Like you don't want to have a kid that where it's actually an, like it's unfair on the child because it's coming into a life where its, father, its parents can't provide them good schooling, a nice house. So like I want to give my kid, not not like spoil him, but really give him a fantastic upbringing. Because they never asked to come into this world. So 100%. They don't, you, they don't owe you anything by existing. Mm. You put them in the world, you better you know, supply 100%. them. 100%. So like if, you know, if I had a child of my own, 100%, like I'm all for giving that kid the, the best possible life it can have. Um, but at the same time, there's no rush. Like I, I'm not, I'm by no means pressured into that. Um, you know, I've got my path on where I'm going in life. I'm completely confident in myself and what, you know, the value I bring. And I'm very, um, I have very set goals as to what I want to achieve at, you know, certain points in my life. And if, you know, if that develops, then I'm 100% for it. But I think also not looking for it either. Like, you know, if it transitions into that or it develops, then 100% I'm for it. Yeah, yeah look, um, if you look at the divorce rate today compared to how it was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, it's obviously skyrocketing. Um, single parenting is, is is up to a huge degree. I think people sort of think that um, kids will kind of provide a proverbial band-aid to a lot of problems in their life. I think that's a mistake. And yeah, it's a, it's a massive, massive responsibility. I mean, I've gone through the fertility treatments, things like that with Sarah, which was an extremely difficult and arduous journey for us both. Um, took a massive toll on us both. And it hasn't a lot of clients and a lot of people I've trained. I haven't trained a single couple that has gone through the fertility process, whether they've conceived or not, that actually hasn't separated. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, the, just on that note, uh, talking about, you know, people, like I said, people think that this, uh, the child or something like that will provide that Band-Aid. And it, it really doesn't. It sort of exacerbates uh, any, uh, you know, issues that were sort of pre-existing or underlying prior Just create a more stressful environment for a ready friction. Oh, absolutely. And like you said, your kid doesn't owe you anything. It's not your kid's responsibility to fix your issues. It's your kid's responsibility to grow up and, you know, experience their life for themselves. And, um, yeah, pe uh, people need to spend more time introspecting on themselves. And, you know, and, they, and if there's any advice I can give anyone that's going through the process or thinking of having a kid, prioritize your partner first. It goes both ways. Um, you know, this whole thing that, you know, your kid comes first in your life, that's, that's bullshit. Because, you know, it's, it's like that oxygen mask scenario they say when you're on a plane – you know, put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you can tend to the kid. It's exactly the same with your partner. If you and your partner are not ironclad and steadfast and solid, you're not going to be in the best position to give your kid everything that they, they need and require to be at their very best. Well, it's essentially so what you do with business is, you know, you look after your employees and they'll look after the clients. Yes. You don't, if you neglect your employees and just focus on clients, you're not going to have a happy workforce then the clients are going to be neglected anyway. Of course. Or if it was your business partner, if you and your yeah. business partner have a sort of tumultuous relationship or you're not solid, you're not going to you know, represent the best unified front with regards to the development of the business thereafter. Well, let's move over to male swimmers swimming with females. <laughs> For fuck's sakes. I just can't believe that we're sitting here in 2022 and we actually, we actually have to sit here and argue the merits of this for the fucking pseudo-intellectual asshats on social media, this sort of fringe culture that believe men can be women. If anything, it just, uh, you know, it's a massive feather in the hat for the patriarchy because men are proving that they can be better women than women can. Or if you look at, you know, who was the man of the, the year when... Rachel Levine. No, so it was when he... Caitlyn Jenner. When he transitioned, he was a man, he was an Olympic athlete, and then he becomes a woman and then wins woman of the year. Well, my best part of the fact, Bruce Jenner himself is very outspoken against trans men competing, yeah, saw that. sorry, trans woman. I don't know what the story is, but biological men competing in women's sports. It's complete fucking bullshit. And then Custer can't even compete in her own gender. Yeah, that's ridiculous. I mean, you've got Laurel Hubbard, who's that war elephant from New Zealand, who competes in, who is a biological man that competes in women's weightlifting, but Custer Semenya, who has super physiological levels of testosterone, can't compete with women. There is some sort of... Um, you know, arguments about the fact that she has undescended testes and so on and so forth. But, you know, La Laurel Hubbard has a ball, has two pairs of, well, a pair of balls and a, and a cock, <laughs> okay? And he has to tuck that, that in while he's competing with women. It's bullshit. 
Could you see it in his lifting yet? So I think Look, I I, again, I don't know whether he's had the the, 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 the snip the, the snip or what the story <laughs> is. I don't care. I think yeah. it's bullshit. I think, you know, Jordan Peterson put it down really well. I can't remember the exact way that he framed it. He said these are a bunch of narcissists that are framing themselves as, you know, some sort of, you know, being oppressed and, you know, at the detriment to women and biological women and girls the world over. It's, it's, absolute fuck, it's absolutely fucking preposterous. And again, I'll say unashamedly and unapologetically that if I had a little girl and she was uncomfortable because she didn't want to use the girl's restroom because there was a, a biological man wearing a wig that wanted to go in there, he's probably going to spend his last six weeks on this planet eating his food through a drip. That's the way it's going to be. It makes no sense because now, you know, that little girl is being exposed to someone that claims maybe they truly do believe it, but either way, you're well, exposing it, it, someone, complete, a third-party person to this person in this restroom. It, well, you know, just all the sort of, the, you know, the sexual deviance and things like that. I mean, look at California. Uh, inmates are being incarcerated according to the gender they identify with. So if I'm a serial pedophile rapist and I identify as a woman... I get locked up with female inmates. It's completely fucking backwards. You know, you've got this new Supreme Court nominee in the United States who's basically going to write legislature and define laws in the United States. And she was selected because she was a black woman. But she was asked by a conservative senator to define the word woman. And she said, I can't because I'm not a biologist. I can't define the word woman because I'm not a biologist. Now, why does this matter? It matters because the trickle-down politics from the United States will eventually, directly or inadvertently, affect us here. And you can see that now. You know, you're starting to get like application forms and it says male, female, other. You know, you start to see the critical race theory and stuff like that that's being taught in schools, which is extremely polarizing and, and racist in nature. It's, it's horrible, horrible ideology, notwithstanding this, this sort of this trans ideology that, that, you know, your gender is fluid and all that sort of stuff. It's just a load of bullshit. Why do you think it's come about a lot more now? Over the well, last, for one, I mean, you could just look at the fact decades. that testosterone levels are 50% today in, in, in your average man than they were 20 years ago. You say it's because of the food. Could be because of the food, could be because of the microplastics in our, in, that we consume on a daily basis, phytoestrogens, pollution. Uh, I did watch a very interesting Joe Rogan podcast with the... I don't know, a physiologist, whatever this person was. So they measured, it's the, you know, your taint. <laughs> so they measured, so they, they took a bunch of men, all the men with lower testosterone levels because of those plastics that you mentioned, their gap from their balls to their bum hole was smaller. And I don't know why, but it correlated perfectly that everyone that had that gap that was smaller had lower testosterone. And it was mm. because of these plastics. And they first tested it in rats where rats had ingested this plastic and whatever their measurement was, because I, I don't know if they have a, much of a taint compared to humans, but it was the same correlation in humans as well. I think also well, you, you'd also think it, it, it could be a lot more insidious, Jess. You know, you look at it that, you know, with regards to Marxist ideolo ideology and stuff that's sort of taking over the West, particularly in the United States and some sort of um, fringe countries in Europe, the first thing that you want to do if you want to take over a society is you want to basically... You want to neuter the men because men stand up, men fight wars, men fight revolutions, strong men protect and provide. So as soon as you sort of, you know, start attacking them and, you know, this is toxic masculinity and you start neutering them proverbially and literally, it's much easier to take over that society from the inside, you know. Um, so, I mean, I'm a big proponent of Jordan Peterson and what he says and he's, you know, very, very vocal about what a this. book of his, Raja. Yeah, you know, he's spectacular. Um uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I think we should all stand up and um, say something. About, I don't know where all the feminists are. You know, I think that they're even the, the loudest and most outspoken of feminists are so scared of being demonized by these fucking morons on social media. As you can see, I don't give a fuck. Fuck all of you. Um, but um, that they're too scared to stand up for women's rights. I mean, J.K. Rowling was fucking recently cancelled because she was outspoken and said, I can't remember exactly what her phrase was, but... You know, w woman, a woman, and a, a man is not a woman. But do you not think society also enables it as well? Like nowadays, if you come forward and say, cool, mom, I think I'll, at 15, I mean, my sister is, you know, around 15, and she has friends that are transitioning as well. And I think to myself, 
if you compare this to our parents' generation, if my dad at 15 went to his dad and said, Dad, I think I want to be a boy, he'd definitely get punched in the head. Yeah, like, I, I, I don't think, think it's just about that. I don't think, it, I don't think you, you had a capacity to make any life-changing or altering decisions at that age. No. You can't drink alcohol until you're 18, but you can have gender reassignment surgery. I mean, in Canada, if you, I mean, as far as I know, there's legislation to say that now if your parents misgender you or something like that, you'll get locked up. Yeah, and they can take you away from your family if your parents refuse to allow you to get hormone replacement therapy at under the age of 18. It makes no sense. How so, can you take yeah. away? Yeah. So if your child is yeah. somehow indoctrinated at school or by one of these fringe sort of groups on social media to basically mutilate their genitals and go on hormone therapy and you're outspoken against it, the Canadian government will lock you up. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Now that Justin Trudeau is also a fucking big sack of shit. Fuck him in particular. Well, what's interesting is, you know, people always say, our country's so bad. I don't think we have it half as bad no, as what's going on over COVID there. COVID has basically just put a big spotlight on it. I mean, Australia is basically a police state. I would rather saw my balls off with a cheese grater than move there. Canada's basically revealed their true colors. I mean, Germany recently at the UN, a lot of the, Germ a lot of the German speakers stood up and basically lambasted Trudeau for being an absolute militant fascist dictator. Um, you know, basically calling people that were protesting against these mandates terrorists and white supremacists and so on and so forth and locking people up and seizing their bank accounts because they were tired of being in complete lockdown for two years. These people were losing, their, losing everything because of this COVID stuff. And um, yeah, you know, you look at the United States and lockdown and stuff like that. I mean, yes, we've got a lot of stuff to complain about, but you have these kind of gray areas that you can kind of work your way through the cracks. I mean, if you get caught with you not wearing a mask in Australia, you, you know, you, you fucked. Whereas if you do that here, you know, you know, a Coke and a fucking handshake gets you a long way. Yes. You know, grass is always green. And as far as I'm concerned, particularly through these lockdown measures and COVID, I'm very glad to have been living in South Africa. I actually had a conversation with a friend of mine. Um, his dad asked me, what do you think about the fact that in South Africa, we often get like a hall pass. Like you can be driving drunk, no license, no number plates, and just, depends on the negotiation like our law is very if anything's fluid it's kind of our law like overseas I, w I mean I went to London about three or four years ago and walked across the road like walked to the other side cop stops me got a ticket I said well for what he's like no jaywalking and I, was so con I said to him I don't I don't even know what like well how's this a thing yeah. looked at my brother I'm like bro did I get a ticket for for walking across the road there's no cars here so the guy's like yeah it's jaywalking so I thought, wow, okay, we have it, we have it quite blessed in our country. It puts it in perspective, actually. Yes, mm. it really does. Yeah. Yeah. And now, speaking of dictators, Putin, this whole situation going on now in the Ukraine, you obviously have more knowledge on it than John and I. Yes. Oh, look, I mean, I just, I think that the the last two years have taught us is not to is to question everything. You know, people look at the stuff that I put on there. I think I'm an anti-vaxxer. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Uh, the vaccine can be. The elixir of youth, for all I'm concerned, I couldn't give a fuck. Actually, like the fact you that said, I can't when people speak about asked, it you know, and question it, that's an issue for me. Yeah, when people ask, is your son vaccinated in terms of, you know, the vaccinations that every kid should go through, you yes. said yes, because it's had the decades of trials and tests. And 100%. It's been proven. Notwithstanding the fact that if there's vaccine injury as a result of, you know, my son, you know, taking one of these vaccines and getting injured or falling ill, there are, there's recourse for me from a financial and legal perspective. I can sue those companies. But the legal loopholes that have been put in place to expedite the delivery of these vaccines means that these companies can basically living with complete legal impunity. You know, like Johnson's and Johnson's, for example, who've shelled out hundreds of billions of dollars over the last 20, 30 years for not only vaccine injury, but um, you know, carcinogens in sunblock and knowingly put, putting asbestos in baby powder and so on and so forth. You know, there need to be checks and balances. It's not that I'm, you know, again, it's not so much questioning the efficacy of the, of the vaccine as it is that, question, you know, everything should be allowed to be questioned. No one should be able, no one should be afforded the right to act with complete impunity and be shielded by mainstream media and big tech. You know, people were saying things a year ago on social media that they were being banned for that is now coming out as being completely ironclad and 100% true when they were being fact-checked by the mainstream media fact-checkers and the big tech fact-checkers. And it just proves that Jack Dorsey of Twitter and Mark Zuckerberg are the biggest fucking bell ends there are. Well, I don't know if you guys know um, the Nalk Boys. Yes. So they had um, Donald Trump on their podcast and that they spoke nothing. They did speak about the, about the ballads being rigged and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff, but they didn't 
accuse anyone and Trump obviously being so polarizing regardless of the topic you know it just gets them views but that video was taken down and nothing of that discussion that they had was anything you know super political it was it was more just about what's your handicap how's it playing golf because I watched the podcast before it was taken down there was some of it that was kind of political obviously being ex-president it's going to happen but why can't we have political discussions I mean the president's video being taken down at what it's, point it's completely unacceptable you know, people might say, oh, well, I hate Donald Trump. Good. Well, what happens when Twitter starts removing people who you don't hate? You know, you can't, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You can't, it's completely unacceptable. I mean, I remember when Twitter banned Julius Malema during the, the our insurrection in South Africa. I thought that was completely unacceptable. It's not right. No one should have that power. And a, a lot of what Trump was doing was he was trying to repeal a lot of the laws that protected big tech. And mainstream media framed it as that he was attacking democracy. You know, just like the you know, mainstream media and big tech frame it as, you know, he's trying to incite an insurrection. That's why we don't have him on there. Okay, cool. Well, why is the, you know, um, you know some, some the, um, the Ayatollah of Iran, he makes tweets calling for the death of every man and children, m man and child in, in Israel. He's still on Twitter. And there's still, you Putin's can have still porn on Twitter. On Twitter. Mm. Well, yeah, 100%. Yeah. You know, it's complete, it's complete horseshit. If, if people can't identify the hypocrisy there, then, you know, I'm, I'm really not interested in engaging with him. You know, I'm not a Julius Malema fan by any stretch of the imagination. I think he's a punk. But I feel that, you know, to basically not afford him a, a platform to talk is very, very, very dangerous. You know, because as far as I'm concerned, would, would Martin Luther King be banned off Twitter and Facebook today? For, you know, forcing insurrections? Would Mandela be banned off Facebook and Twitter today? Probably. And those good things that they did might never have happened. Exactly. You know, as, it, it, never in history have the people that have been banning books and forcing book burning and causing the censorship, they've never been on the right side of history, ever. And if people don't identify that, it's very scary. Yeah. Any last thoughts? Anything else you guys want to touch on? You want to moan at? Any complaints? Um, no, I mean, it's pretty good. Cool. Yeah. Sweet guys, thanks for watching. Yeah.